Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 14th Global Public Seminar in Comparative and International Education. These seminars are jointly organized by the Department of Education and St. Edmund Hall at the University of Oxford. As many of you know, my name is Maria chang -Siliani. I'm Associate Professor of Comparative International Education here at Oxford. Uh, before introducing our speaker, let me attend to a few administrative points. This webinar, as you might have noticed already, is being recorded and it will be posted online in due course. We will only be recording the first half of the webinar, the presentation itself. We won't be recording the Q&A session. Can I ask you to please keep yourself muted throughout the webinar unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question? To ask a question, use the chat function. We would like to ask you to write out your question that you wish to ask. At the end of the presentation, if your question is selected, I will invite you to ask it yourself directly. When I invite you to ask your question, please unmute yourself, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. We have a few more uh, webinars advertised to the end of the academic year. I think we have two more, one in June and one in July. In the next few moments, I will share a link in the chat to the web page where you can learn about the topics of these two forthcoming webinars and book a place. I will also share a link to the YouTube page where you can watch some of our past webinars if you're interested. Now let me introduce today's speaker. Michelle Schweizfuss is Professor of Comparative and International Education at the School of Education at the University of Glasgow. She leads the research and teacher group in education leadership and policy, and she's also a program leader for the new masters in international and comparative education at the School of Education. Michelle is originally from Canada. She has a wide range of international experiences as a researcher, as a teacher, and as an advisor. She's an alumna of our Department of Education at Oxford, where she completed her MSc in Comparative and International Education. She has a PhD in Education from the University of Warwick. As a comparative educationist, Michelle's work focuses on the tensions between the global frameworks and local and cultural imperatives. More specifically, in her current and recent work, Michelle Schweizfuss has focused on pedagogy, on democratic education, and global citizenship education. In pedagogy research, her work uh, revolves around learner-centered pedagogy as a traveling policy and practice. Michelle has also studied the relationship between education and various forms of development, especially political development. Last but not least, she has worked on the topics of university internationalization and transnational cultural and academic experiences of internationally mobile students. This afternoon, Michelle Schweizfuss will be presenting um, a paper about the divided world of comparative research on pedagogy. I will now pass over to Michelle and would like to thank her very much for finding time to give this talk. Thank you very much, Maya, for that introduction. Um, I'll just share my screen or try to. We've all been here, haven't we? Yes. <laughs> Can you see that? Yes. It's Fantastic. Great. That's that's always a good start. That's always a good start. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you very much for for coming along this afternoon, or or this morning, or this evening, wherever wherever you are, and whatever time it is. Uh, as Maya said, I'm I'm going to be talking today about a world of comparative research on pedagogy, which I think is quite a divided world, and I'm I'm going to be drawing on a range of different projects and, and pieces of research and thinking that I've been doing and, and trying to, to knit these together. And I'll be, I'll be talking first a little bit about what pedagogy is. I'll be defining it and, and talking about a particular conceptualization of it, which I think helps to explain these divisions, um, particularly for people who, who perhaps don't specialize in pedagogy. I'll be thinking through and, and talking about the implications of that definition for research and for comparative research. And then I'll be 
talking about comparative pedagogy specifically, so looking at pedagogy comparatively and mapping that field of research, um, the contexts for the, that research, the purposes, the implications. And I'll also take a little bit of a digression to explain what's been called the pedagogical nexus. I will then say a little bit about these contrasting perspectives, which we might consider to be contrasting epistemic communities. And I will conclude with some reflections on so what? I mean, does it matter if we have a divided world of comparative education research around pedagogy, or is this simply an academic question for, for us to consider? So let me start with a definition. And um, I always use the same definition. Robin Alexander was my PhD supervisor and, and still a great influence on me. And Robin Alexander posited that pedagogy encompasses both the observable act of teaching and the theories, beliefs, and debates which underpin it. So we can see what a teacher is doing, but there is something behind it which is also important up to, to this understanding of pedagogy. So we might, we might think of these two dimensions as a kind of iceberg. So the observable aspect of pedagogy is the tip of the iceberg, the teaching methods that we can see if we are sitting in a classroom, but not observable and behind that, influencing that, is the teacher's individual philosophy, the wider philosophy of education in his or her context, personal beliefs, cultural beliefs, the policies that shape pedagogy, global best practice ideas and, and other drivers. And of course, that's the much bigger part of pedagogy. And thinking about that pedagogy and thinking about pedagogy that way starts to raise a number of questions about how we research it. So one is in a way most straightforward to research. You know, we, we know what we see, getting at what's behind it. We need to approach that using different methods um, that are only going to give us proxies for what teachers really believe and, and what's shaping that. Which matters the most? Well, um, yeah, maybe what teachers do matters the most, but if what's behind that is important in shaping it, that's very significant as well. And then if we're thinking comparatively, there's a big question about what are the challenges to comparing each of these across different contexts, for example, across different countries. So if you're an insider or an outsider observing a teacher, how do you interpret the meaning of the observable? Um, how do you judge fairly about what you're seeing? And all of these questions um, led myself and, and some colleagues to think about how researchers have studied pedagogy comparatively based on published research since the year 2000. And 2000 was the year we chose partly because that was the transition year between the, the SDGs and the MDGs. And also because that was the year that Robin Alexander published his seminal work on pedagogy and culture. So, um, uh, this is for some reason not progressing. Is that moving? There we go, I'll do it that way. Okay, so um, we proposed a project. This is with uh, my colleagues, Matthew Thomas and Amy Smale. And we proposed a project called Revisiting Comparative Pedagogy. The, the publication for that has just recently come out in Compare. But what we did was we searched for all the comparative articles on pedagogy that were published in 10 key journals in the field from, um, from 2000 until the present. And we found 52 of those. Now, you might ask questions about how did you identify the key journals? Were they in multiple languages? No, these were only English language journals. Um, and these were only comparative articles. So they were articles about pedagogy in more than one context. And what we did was we mapped the intentions of these studies, the contexts, the data gathering methods, and their approaches to comparison. And among other things, we looked at the different 
contexts that were compared. This is just a, a map that, that suggests obviously that there was concentration in certain parts of the world, less in some other parts. Sometimes the comparisons were between countries of a similar level of development, um, sometimes not. So the, the, this was a very, very mixed and, and complex picture. But what I wanna focus on today is some important emergent themes from this review. We looked at the focus of each study. Um, after we'd read through all of these and had long discussions, it was clear that some of the studies focused on the processes of pedagogy and some of them focused more on outcomes. So some of them were much more concerned with what was happening in the classroom and why, and others were much more concerned with, with learning outcomes of, of various kinds, sometimes about basic literacy and numeracy, sometimes about wider social and outcomes. And we also were interested in how the articles operationalized the contexts in which the pedagogy was taking place, whether they conceptualized it as an ecosystem or as a set of variables. And I'm going to take a little bit of a digression here to explain what I mean by an ecosystem, context as an ecosystem. So um, there are a number of uh, researchers that have done some interesting work around this. I like the concept of the pedagogical nexus, which was proposed by Houghton and Elliott in, in 2000 and which um, Elliot and I have developed further since then. And this concept originally emerged from a study of um, Russian schools. And what Houghton and Elliot found in studying these Russian schools was that certain patterns, certain pedagogical patterns were consistent from pre-communist times through communism to post-communist times into the present despite the huge policy changes, despite the massive political changes, despite all the, the other changes that had happened in that period, there was a certain amount of pedagogical resilience. So that when you went into a Russian classroom anywhere in the country, there were still really quite remarkable similarities across time and across place. And they, they looked at why this might be, and they found a number of factors that none of which individually explained it, but all of which together formed a nexus. They reinforced each other. They've created a kind of impenetrable net so that if you changed policy, it didn't break through this, this net. And some of that was about culture. Some of it was about structures. Some of it was about specific practices and, and intergenerational continuities. But there were many different parts of this nexus, but it wasn't the fact that it was parts, it was the whole that made the difference and the ecosystemic way that those parts work together. And, and similarly, Rapalai and Kamatsu proposed the idea of the ontocultural context. And they, this, con this concept for them emerged from a study of the import of Japanese practices of lesson study to the US. And they looked at lesson study, they, they looked at it in Japan and looked at how it reflected particular Japanese norms of interaction and being with others that were reinforced in school, that were social, that were in school, that were then reinforced in school, reinforced socially. And so through these processes, Japanese children became Japanese teachers who learned to be part of a group, respect each other as equals and as a collective, continuously self-improve, all of which are dispositions that lesson study requires. So, you try to take something like lesson study out of a culture like that, you bring it to the US, which is arguably more individualistic and competitive. And in most cases, it simply didn't work. And so what they argue is this is an example of pedagogy remaking the ontoculture and the ontoculture remaking the pedagogy over and over again in repeated cycles. <laughs> 
So what these concepts all have in common is that they are ultimately pointing to the ecosystemic nature of education systems and practices. So that's a little digression just to explain what I mean about ecosystem, but getting back to the study I was talking about. So we placed each of these 52 studies on two continua. We, we scored them uh, on a scale of one to four as either process focused or outcome focused somewhere along that, that scale, or we scored them as having, as conceptualizing context as an ecosystem or context as a set of variables, discrete variables that could be described and, and separated. And, and each of the studies was, was placed somewhere along each of those two continua. And we then created a matrix. So we, we crossed these two, these two axes and we placed each study somewhere along this, these axes. So, so if a study used um, an ecosystem oriented conceptualization of context and was focused on process, it would be in quadrant C. And if it had an outcomes focus and made discrete variables out of the context, it would be in quadrant B. And the bigger the circle, the more studies, the, the, the greater the number of studies um, that fit into that quadrant. And as you can see, the two quadrants that really stand out are the process-focused ecosystem-oriented quadrant C and the outcome-focused variable-oriented quadrant B. Not only because these are where the largest number of studies were situated, but also because that's where you find the most extreme ones, yeah, which, which, um, which fit very strongly into one or the other. So, so we, with the 11 con articles in quadrant B, as well as sharing a concern for outcomes with an a priori list of, uh, of ingredients of context, also we found had a number of other things in common. They tend to reference the standards agenda. They tend to reference the learning crisis. They tend to seek to intervene to improve outcomes. So they need to have those variables to manipulate. They tend to use quantitative methodology and they were often funded by aid agencies or national governments. And in contrast, in quadrant C, the studies were much more likely to be qualitative and interpretive, culturalist in perspective. They were more likely to be self-funded or else funded by research councils or other funders that had, um, had a, a greater emphasis on blue skies research rather than, rather than um, policy oriented research. And they were less, because they were less oriented toward making recommendations than contributing to knowledge. So we found once we set up these, these quadrants, we could see a number of other differences between these studies. And what was also quite struck, striking was how little cross-referencing there was across these quadrants. So the articles in quadrant B didn't mention, didn't reference the same literature as the articles in, in, in the contrasting quadrant. So it was like they were working in parallel universes. They didn't reference each other and they didn't reference the same literature. There were these completely different worlds of comparative pedagogy going on. And in, in thinking about these contrasting worlds, I find Haas's notion of an epistemic community quite useful. So Haas proposed that an epistemic community is a group of people who have a, a shared set of beliefs which provide a value-based rationale for action. So you can imagine that in each of these quadrants there are people who believe something about pedagogy, believe something about how it works, believe something about what it's for and how to make it better. Shared causal beliefs about what shapes pedagogy, right? Shared notions of validity Right, which again, you know, validity in quantitative studies tends to have a slightly different meaning from validity in qualitative studies. Um, and they have a common policy enterprise and set of common practices. And this notion of a policy enterprise, I think, is particularly important in quadrant B and thinking about those studies in quadrant B as 
being situated in an epistemic community, we can very quickly see the wider epistemic community in which this is situated. And this is a very influential, powerful, well-funded epistemic community. So we see, for example, uh, the Global Education Evidence Advisory Panel, which is um, a, a joint enterprise between a number of funders, including the World Bank and the UK FCDO. And this is a panel of global experts on education, um, the majority of which are economists, who review the evidence on pedagogical and other interventions to improve learning outcomes, and then say which are the great buys, which are the good buys, which are the okay buys for investment for governments, um, based on them having a strong evidence base. And that evidence base is almost always drawn from randomized control trials. Um, I feel also that there is within this particular epistemic community, uh, certain discourses such as the discourse of quality teachers which a discourse that I struggle with because I, we would never talk about quality students, I hope, because that would be labeling them. That would be assuming that people have a fixed identity that can only be, that it can only perform to one level under any circumstances. We know that's not true for students. It's not for, true for teachers, but it's a convenient construct when you're trying to move from a particular idea of what shapes pedagogy to a particular idea of a desirable outcome, then having the idea of a quality teacher becomes a part of that equation. And we also find that the World Bank's um, foray into pedagogy, they have developed a, um, an observation tool, which uh, was launched in 2019, complete with training packages, for implementation in lower and middle income countries across the world using the same observation schedule. So a quantified observation schedule where teachers are graded from one to five on a range of things that they are doing. So again, that atomization of, of pedagogy, that atomization, that breaking into variables and that quantification so that, so that teachers can be compared one to the other, but teaching, but the pedagogy can actually be compared across different contexts, including different countries. So this, this is very much part of the same epistemic community, part of the same set of, set of practices, same, same set of values, same, same ideas about validity. And this outcomes orientation and the linking of variables to outcomes, this, this fits you know, into that big comparative education agenda and also the great critique that stems from comparative education about transferring practice from one context to another. And comparative studies have shown again and again that having the normative idea of good practice and trying to transplant that practice from one place to another is hugely problematic. And this is partly because, you know, if we go back to that iceberg and think about what we observe, but also what lies behind it, you know, those epistemological relationship dimensions with pedagogy, they're very much intertwined with cultural beliefs and they are below that iceberg waterline. We can't see them. We can see what teachers do, but we can't know why through an observation schedule. But that is incredibly important for understanding what they do. But this pedagogical best practice that is situated within this epistemic community, it's still largely promoted as a technique, you know, as something that can be moved around. And a classic example from, from my own work on learner-centered pedagogy, you know, in, you know, in the post 1990s world, virtually every country in Sub-Saharan Africa had learner-centeredness or some variation of that constructivism or, or uh, problem-based learning embedded in education policy. So, you know, a vast study of policies across Africa, we see the same prescriptions and yet, 
when we look at the literature on this, we see again and again that um, this transplanting of an idea of best practice from one place to another simply doesn't work. And I like the, the notion of tissue rejection, which again draws on a, 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 an organic metaphor to explain this, that you can't simply transplant a heart from some organic being into another and expect it to work. Um, this is what happened with learner-centered pedagogy in most of the places where it was implemented as an, as a, as an imported foreign policy. So this suggests that there is something to the pedagogical nexus, that there is something organic going on. There are many reasons why policies don't take hold. Sometimes they aren't rolled out very well. Sometimes they're not very well thought through. But if you look in this literature, it's often about just a very poor fit with what was already a very deeply entwined, deeply self-reinforcing, long-standing set of norms and beliefs that uh, did not welcome this, or even if it welcomed it, it didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't able to penetrate that nexus. So I think there's definitely something to the pedagogical nexus. And I, I want to conclude with a couple of questions that, that bring us back to the so what. So, so, the, so the world of comparative pedagogical research is divided. So we're still importing uh, ideas and imagining that we can use the same tool to look at um, practice across different places. I, I think there are a set of questions about, you know, what are the risks that come with this divided world of comparative research on pedagogy? You know, what are the vested interests and, and do they matter? Excuse me, I, I think they do matter. I suppose I probably wouldn't be, wouldn't be talking about this and getting, getting so worked up about if I, if I didn't think it did matter. And, and I, I think it matters because, well, I've, I've got a position on this and I, if it's not clear to you by now, I will, I will be explicit about it. I, the pedagogical nexus, I really do believe the evidence is there that this, is, this explains much better how pedagogy actually functions in different contexts, much more so than having discrete variables, which, which are isolated and manipulated. But learning outcomes matter. And the fact that the people who are using this pedagogical nexus sort of view are, are only concerned about processes or mainly concerned about processes. And the people who are, who are working with variables are the ones who are thinking about outcomes is a cause for concern to me. I, I think we I think that there, there, there should be scope for, for cross-fertilization between these different perspectives where we can, where these different epistemic communities can try to do what almost becomes an interdisciplinary uh, take on, on, on pedagogy because these epistemic communities are so different. And I, I would just like to say too that I'm 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 hoping to develop these ideas further. And if anybody knows of some good examples of cross fertilization, some some good collaborations between these different epistemic communities, someone who has managed to build a bridge between these these different views of the world and and very different takes on pedagogy, I would I would very much like to to hear about it. So thank you very, very much for, for your attention. And um, there's a list of, of references there. I assume that if anybody wants to see that list, they will be able to access it some other way. And shall I stop sharing now, Maya? Yes, thank you.